Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life. Hey, it's great to see everybody again. We've got a terrific guest with us today, Steve Campbell, the Brain Whisperer. How are you doing, Steve? Good. I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. This is going to be insightful. Oh. Uh, Steve, you're always insightful, I have to say. <laughs> Um, and here's the, here's the kickoff, uh, because I know we're talking about stopping smoking. Mm -hmm. My brother was a big smoker. My mother smoked all her life. My brother went on a, a trip to Europe. Was it Europe? It was at the Far East. Came back and had quit smoking. Cold yeah. turkey. Had quit. And not only did he quit smoking, he got my mother to quit smoking wow. after a lifetime of smoking. That's and amazing. he did it the same way. He just said, well, you got to quit. You, you got to want to do it. You quit. You take a deep breath, blah, blah, blah. Well, inside of a year, he was smoking again. <laughs> so what he did worked for her, worked for him temporarily, worked for her, but it didn't really work for him. Mm -hmm. So, I, And, of course, now they have patches. They have all kinds of stuff. And the real question is, because we're talking about we're talking to the brain whisperer about, you know, our head. How do we, how do we get our turn our head around to quit smoking? What's the best way to quit smoking? How do you do it? Well, we need to understand some psychology first. Let me say that there is no best way for one person because we're also very different. So, your mother, you chose one way. My wife chose another way. So let's let's talk about. Um, what are the principles that cause people to stop smoking? I think that might be a better word. And I want to start with what I call the problem with pejoratives. Don't worry, that's a big word, but you'll understand what I mean. So often when we say, I'm going to not smoke, we need to realize that your brain does not understand the word not. It doesn't know what to do with it because you're giving it two messages. I will not smoke. I will, okay, not, wait a minute, smoke. And the brain hates that. It hates the word not because it doesn't know what to do with it. So let me give you an example. When you're at a Mexican restaurant and the waitress puts down the plate and she says, don't touch that plate, it's really hot. What do you got to do? Touch the plate. <laughs> it's when, you see, nature, yep. when you see a wet paint sign, don't touch this. What do you got to do? There was a hotel that was created in Galveston. They built it. And just before they opened it, the managers got together and said, what are we going to do about the balconies on the second, third floor? Because people are going to be fishing off the balconies. And all the weights will be breaking the windows on the first floor. And one guy said, let's make some signs. So they did. On every balcony, on the second and third floor, in every room, on the glass door was a sign, absolutely no fishing from the balcony. You already know what happened. Within a month, three glasses have been broken because of fishing from the balcony. So they got together all the managers, and they said, what are we going to do? And one little guy said, why don't we just take down those stupid signs? And they did. They haven't broken a glass since. That's the way your brain works. So let's look at how the brain learns and then what we can do with that. We'll use my daughter as an example. My daughter was raised in Roner Park, a little enclave about 50 miles north of San Francisco. She knew nothing about a city. So Mary said to me, we've got to teach Sarah about the city. So I said, okay, I will. So I'm an academic, so I read her a book. Here's how we learn physiologically. I read her a book. The brain recorded that book as a neural cluster, a little cluster of neurons under the prefrontal cortex, under your forehead. I read her another book, the brain recorded another cluster. We interviewed some people in Oakland, there's another cluster. San Francisco, there's another cluster. We showed her some fire engines and some trucks and some parking lots. And the brain's full 
of all these little neural clusters that she learns during the day. Here's what happens when she went to sleep that night, her brain said, oh, wonderful. Now leave me alone for the next eight hours because now what I need to do is I need to take all of the stuff that you taught me during the day and do something with it. So I looked at all the things, the fire engines and the trucks and the skyscrapers and the people and it looked for similarities. It looked for connections. If it couldn't find connections, it said, you know what? Here's a book about a city. There's a book about a city. There's no connection. There should be one. So it creates a connection, axons, dendrites, synaptic clefts, etc., and it starts connecting all of these things that Sarah learned during the day. How many can they connect? The connections are based on the number of brain cells that you have, which is around 83 billion. Each of those cells are connected to an average of 10,000 other cells. Those connections determine how many patterns the brain can carry. The patterns are based on the number of brain cells, which are 83 billion, to the power of 10,000. What's that? 83 billion times 83 billion, 10,000 times. It's a number we cannot even fathom. So what are we saying? We're saying this, that your brain has no limit to how many patterns it can carry. That has to do with smoking. What? For the first, <laughs> let me, let me, let, you got me. Okay, let me share with you a story and then we'll bring it all together. For the first 10 years of my life, Mary said to her, uh, to herself, I am a smoker. And she was, and she learned that. And the more she said it, the more the brain created little neural clusters up here saying, I am a smoker for 10 years. Actually, she'd been a, a smoker for 30 years. And every January 1st, you say, this is the year, this is the year, I'm not going to smoke, I'm not going to smoke. It will last for a week, a month, and then she go back to smoking. Why? Because there is a pattern up there, which Mary had saying, I am a smoker. And she was. And when she said to herself, I'm not going to smoke, the brain said, I don't understand that. Because I don't understand the word not. And you are a smoker, so you should be smoking. And she did for 10 years of our marriage at the very beginning. Then one summer, she went home to visit her father, who had emphysema. And she was there when he died. And I picked her up at SFO. And she looked at me and she said, you are looking at a non-smoker. What happened? She created in her mind a new self-image of being a non-smoker. What's a self-image? A self-image is simply how you see yourself. And they are learned. They're based on what you say to yourself about yourself. So for 30 years, Mary said, I am a smoker. And your brain, her brain said, yes, you are. Yes, you are. And she smoked. Then she watched her father die. I picked her up and she said, you are looking at a non-smoker. She created in her mind a new self-image right under here of being a non-smoker. Here's what's exciting, though. Every single time she refused to smoke, every single time she was tempted and she said, I'm not going to do this, the brain created a new self-image of being a non-smoker. And eventually, that self-image became predominant to where she hasn't smoked for around 40 years. Now, this is really important to understand. And this is what happened to your brother, John. There is still a self-image in Mary of being a smoker. How do I know? Because she never had a lobotomy. Yeah. So it's in there somewhere. But every single time she does not smoke, it becomes less and less and less a part of how she sees herself. Why is smoking so difficult? 
because there is a very, very strong self-image in the mind of a smoker of being a smoker, in the mind of a smoker of being a smoker. So what can we do with that? Okay, this is really important to understand. First of all, the desire to not smoke has to come from that person. It cannot come from someone else. It can't be made up. It can't come from you got to do it, you got to do it. It has to come from that person. Why? Because it has to come from the brain rewiring itself to that person being a non-smoker. And it has to be an everyday thing. Now, here's a wonderful thing about the brain. It's called neuroplasticity. When you lock on to, I am a non-smoker, and I love the freedom, and I love the way my lungs feel, and the fact that I can walk, and I don't have ashes all over myself, the brain says what? Okay, is it true? I don't even care. All I care about is what you tell me. It's like a story. There's a wonderful character to the brain, and that is the brain locks onto what you decide is important. So Mary locked onto smoking for 30 years, and she smoked. Then she watched her father die, and she made a decision. I am not going to be, not will be, I am a non-smoker. This is really important to understand. Let's talk about goals. Most of our goals don't work because what's what we say to ourselves? We say, I will stop smoking. And know what your brain says to that? Hope you do. Sounds wonderful. Sounds great. I'm going to go take a nap. Because number one, I have no idea what's going to happen in the future. Number two, I cannot control the future. Number three, I am so busy dealing with the present that the future isn't really important to me. So what we do is we put our goals somewhere out there. Someday, I will not smoke. And the brain says, wonderful. I don't have to do a thing. Another thing we say is, I'm going to really try this. Well, when you say, I'm going to really try this, it's like my saying to myself, I'm going to try to pick this up. I reach for it, I pick it up, and the person says to me, no, 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 don't pick it up. Try to pick it up. I don't understand. Try to pick, it doesn't work. When you say, I'm trying, the brain says, wonderful. Try the rest of your life. I don't have to do a thing. Why does the brain do that? Because the brain does not want you to change. Do you hear that? Say it again. The brain hates change. Change is risky. Change is different. Change is scary, and your brain's job is to keep you safe. So if you've been smoking for 30 years, your brain said, don't, don't, don't quit, don't quit, don't quit. You've always been doing this. I don't care whether it's good for you or not. I want you to be right where you are, where you've always been. So what you say is, wait a minute. I'm the boss. What I say is true. And here's the wonderful characteristics of your brain. Your brain says, oh, okay, because I believe everything you tell me. That's what Mary said to her brain. I am, not will be, not should be, not I'll try. I am a non-smoker. And the brain says, okay. Now, how do you get to that point? There's all sorts of different ways. There's patches. There's groups. There's books. There's websites. There's drugs you can even take. And each of those fit different people. With Mary, 
it was watching her father die. And I picked her up and she said, I am a non-smoker. So is there one particular way? It depends upon the person. Mary tried everything, it didn't work. Finally, she saw this and she said to herself, I am a non-smoker. And her brain said, yes, you are. Because I believe everything you tell it. Like, here's another story. When Mary was a principal, one time we were talking in the evening. She said, I got to tell you what happened this morning. I woke up and I said to myself, I'm going to have a horrible day because I'm going to have to deal with this horrible parent at 830 at a meeting. And she's been coming to my seminars for years. And she realized that when she said, I'm going to have a horrible day, her brain's going to say, oh, okay, you're right. I'll make sure it's horrible. I'll look for ways to make it horrible. So she said, I got out of bed. I never saw this because I was in my office studying. And she talked to her brain. And she said, okay, wait a minute. I'm the boss. I'm going to have a great day. You hear me? And she said, Steve, I saw my brain kind of bumping ethereal in front of me, and the eyes got really big, and the brain said, oh, okay, you're the boss. I believe you. I'll look for ways to make it great. And number one, the parent never showed up. Number two, she had a wonderful meeting with her prince, with her boss. That was great. And she came on, she said, I've had one of the best days I've had so far this year. Here's the point. When we say, I will not smoke, it's not going to work. Because the brain doesn't know what to do with the, with the not. And when you say, I will not, the brain says, good luck. It's basically saying, I am a non-smoker. Getting there is where you lock on to it. It's like when I was a little boy, my dad taught me how to ride a bicycle. And he took me out to this road and said to me, now you see that rock out there? Yes, Daddy. Don't run into that rock. And I got down on my knees, eyes locked onto the rock so I would not run into it. What happened? Right into the rock. That's the way your brain works. You lock onto the freedom of being a non-smoker. It all starts up here. It starts with the way you're thinking. And the wonderful thing about your brain is your brain just says, oh, okay, I believe you. Is it easy? Of course not. Because you've been saying you're a smoker all your life. But you can create a new self-image by a simple decision and lock on to it. And at first, it's minute by minute then hour by hour, and as the brain rewires itself, then it becomes day by day, week by week, month by month, until smoking is just not a part of your life. Because that's what you're locking on to. And your brain says, I believe everything you tell it. And my job is to make it come true. Wow. So is there one best way to quit? It depends upon who you are and what works for you. And if you go back to smoking, that's your decision. And unfortunately, John, you can't really change that. That's where your brother has to make that decision to do so. Well, I have to tell you that I, I, I must uh, interject an illustration that buttresses all that you just said. Uh, I don't even know whether John knows that I used to be a smoker. Uh, we've been together working projects, partners for uh, so going on 10 years, one form or another. Uh, I was a heavy smoker. What's heavy? Over three packs a day for most of my life, up until 25 years ago. And uh, I mean, when I was, uh, what kind of a smoker was I? I was a kind of smoker that when I was in the military, I would smoke in the shower because you could always put the cigarette up on the top, there'd be a little ledge, and you'd smoke in between washing up. I mean, I was a serious smoker. I was such a serious smoker that when I quit smoking two or three times, I would try to ride in the smoking car on the commuter railroad because I was not smoking anymore, 
but I just love that. Or going up the stairs of the subway, you'd always want to be behind people lighting up their cigarettes, even as somebody who didn't smoke. And I did that about three times, uh, once for three years. And uh, oh, I can tell you all the what now seems funny stories <clears throat> about how I started once again. But uh, about 25 years ago, I woke up one morning without being nagged by anybody and just said, I know it's not good for me. And I know that it's probably going to cut 10 or 15, 20 years off my life. I don't smoke anymore. I am a non-smoker. And from that moment on, I didn't have any heebie-jeebies. I didn't have, I was a non-smoker. So much so that while I could tolerate being somewhat near people, I couldn't rent a car that was not a non-smoking car. I was very uncomfortable in hotel rooms from that moment on. So it's just my, basically my brain, it, it just clicked. So I suspect that there's a piece of what you've said in all of my illustrations. Uh, but I smoked heavily up until about 25 years ago. And then within a day or two, it was like I'd never smoked before. You're really right. It really does work that way. There, there's another interesting psychological feature that I like to talk about, and that is the conscious, the subconscious, and then the creative subconscious. The conscious is basically what we see, what we feel, what we think, etc. Most of what's going on with us mentally is in the subconscious. We're not aware of what's going on in the subconscious. There's a third element, though, called the creative subconscious. It's in the subconscious that our self-images are. So when I say I am a smoker, the job of the creative subconscious is to make sure that what I do lines up with those self-images. So when I'm a smoker, the job of the creative smoker is to the, the the job of the creative subconscious is to make sure that I am a smoker. That's what happened to you. You said, "I am creating art, a new self-image mm -hmm. of being a non-smoker." I'm locking on to that, just like Mary. But you didn't need to watch your father die. You simply said, I am making this decision. And you know what your brain said? Okay, is it true? Don't even care. All I care about is what you tell me. You say you are a non-smoker, you lock onto that, I'll make sure it's true. And the more you say it, the easier it becomes. That's why this is so exciting. People say, why wasn't this taught 40 years ago? And my answer is, we did not know this 40 years ago. 40 years ago, the brain was simply discovered by looking at autopsies. Now we can watch the brain work while it's working through the technology that we have. And we can apply this to so many parts of our life. So basically, we are the ones that say, I am a non-smoker. Not, I will not smoke, not, I should do. I am a non-smoker. That's what you did, Art. Mm -hmm. And your brain said, okay. Okay, yeah. Good for true. you. It was true. Amazing the way it works. Just it amazing. is. It really is. And it's very exciting. And, and I love the way you explain it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. And now, on behalf of Art and my brother, my mother, and all those non smokers out there, thanks, Steve, and we'll see you again soon. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends, Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life.